Welcome to another episode of DD on the Spot. As always, I'm your host, Ryan Johnson. Before we get into it with our guest here today, I'd like to remind everyone, if you enjoy this content, to please go like and subscribe down below. I'd greatly appreciate it. We have Lee K. Roos on the podcast. She's coming to us from the UK. We have another guest from Nottingham. I mean, that's the second guest that we've had on from that area. So, I mean, it must be a fitness hotbed there, at, at least in my opinion. I don't even know for sure. But yeah, she's really... She's done everything. She's been an IFBB pro. She's been a powerlifter. She's doing CrossFit now. I mean, she's done everything. So I figured she has all the expertise and everything. So she'd be the perfect guest to have on. But yeah, she's just on here to share her journey with us and discuss all things health and fitness. But most importantly, Lee, thank you so much for coming on. Pleasure. Well, thank you so much for asking me, sir. I'm freaking happy. Uh, Hey, I appreciate that. And I normally ask about the weather, but you know, during this time of the year, completely not even going to mention it because dear god so to get things started on a more positive note why don't you give us your backstory on what inspired and motivated you to get in shape and how that led to where you're at right now uh well it's i mean like a long convoluted story so I'll just take as much time as you want slice it down to the bare essentials so um obviously i had cancer and um i was really really unhealthy and i didn't know anything about fitness I didn't know anything about health I did not know anything about nutrition so you know my diet consisted of one bucket of KFC a day uh and and you know that was kind of like what I ate um and then when the cancer got cleared and I like got the all go to that I was like you know healthy it was kind of like okay well maybe I should actually take this opportunity to to get healthy and you know, I've got an opportunity to live, to be better, to actually treat my body better. So that kind of led me down the route of health. And um, it was kind of like that snowball effect of kind of like I met people who were in bodybuilding and I was like, how hard can this be? You know, as one does when one has no idea how hard something actually is and is looking from an outsider's perspective. Um, And then it kind of like it was one of those – my first fitness goal was a pull up, and I got that. And we're gonna discuss this in a little bit, but she's clearly mastered that and above and beyond. <laughs> Sorry. So my first, my first experience was obviously getting a pull up, and then I started developing little ab things, and you know, I was eating relatively healthy obviously I didn't know anything about nutrition so as one does one goes well red meat's bad for you etc etc so I was eating all the wrong stuff you know healthy but not necessarily good stuff you know like five protein shakes a day because you know that's that's what you're supposed to do um and then kind of just progressively learnt more I never had a coach I've always been self-taught um well, not self-taught, but I always experimented and figured out how my body responded better. And then after about six months of, you know, not knowing what I was actually doing, I decided to step on stage because, you know, that's what someone does. Um, and I showed up with the wrong tan. Well, almost no tan whatsoever. You know, I just bought a little, like one of those sh- spray on tan things from, you know, the shops arrived with the little blinged out bikini that I'd made myself because I'd seen WBFF and thought, well, that's what all the girls wear. Of course, they weren't wearing that. Uh, And somehow I came second. And that was just, you know, the start of it. I didn't know how to pose uh, and took it from there. So, yeah, that's kind of like me in a nutshell when when it comes to bodybuilding. And I mean, you've done everything as well. You've done powerlifting. You've done, you're now you're doing CrossFit. What caused you to change those things? And what's that journey been like just evolving and doing different types of fitness? So I actually never really focused on the powerlifting. I kind of did it for shits and giggles. I don't know. Can I swear? Yeah. Um, Because I have a really naughty mouth. They'll, Um, they'll, They'll be bleeped out. I'll say like. It's kind of like a PG-13 movie where you can say like the F word once or so, but like it'll, it'll all be bleeped out anyway. So yeah, don't hold yourself back. Okay, cool. So I off-season bodybuilding, like I bulked up way too much. I mean, we look at the footage of me bulking and I'm like, wow, I didn't bulk. I just got fat. Um, but when you're in the moment, you think, you know, like, yeah, I'm doing the right thing. And then looking back, you're like, no, I just got fat. Um, so... <laughs> 
when I was off season, I was like, another goal of mine was to do a powerlifting comp. My numbers were relatively good for someone who had literally never trained powerlifting. So I gave it a go and broke a few records just for shits and giggles. Um, so it was one of those, because I am naturally strong, as my husband keeps on reminding me, um, it was something that just I did for fun. Um, rather than actually taking it seriously. So then I got my FBB Pro card and then, of course, lockdown hit. And I was actually about to stop prepping for my pro debut, lockdown hit, no weights, what can I do? And then I saw some CrossFit girls. And again, it's kind of like, well, how hard can this be? You know, all they're doing is some weightlifting stuff which I knew nothing about and some handstand walks and in a week I taught myself how to handstand walk so I was kind of like well you know let me try that um so then I I delved into CrossFit as as you know like straight on in full hit storm ahead and I did relatively well um so I, I came first in the one uh front squat challenge uh, and came 10th in the world in last year. Um, but then I just couldn't maintain it, or to be honest. Like, in terms of training, CrossFit is the worst. Like, bodybuilding, you're training, you know, an hour. When you're in your peak, you're kind of like doing an hour of weights and an hour of cardio, and that's kind of like the max, um, because obviously you don't want to lose gains in the process of prepping for a show. Whereas with CrossFit, I was training up to eight, nine hours a day. And it just, it was all consuming to the point that my hair started falling out and um, I was crying every single day and I couldn't sleep because my central nervous system was just fried. So I actually, I've actually stopped CrossFit um, as a result. Um, so I'm actually now taking powerlifting seriously and seeing what I can actually do if I actually dedicate myself 100% to powerlifting. The downside is I am now 20 kilograms lighter than I was when I actually did powerlifting. So all my numbers that I look at and I'm like, oh, yes, once upon a time I could back squat 220 kilograms and then I started CrossFit and my, then I tore my hamstring learning how to run as one does. So my back squat is plummeted, um, and if you know anything about CrossFit, um, you, you're not supposed to be good at anything. You're supposed to be average at everything across the board. So, of course, I sacrificed a lot of strength in order to bring up my weaknesses. So now I'm kind of like, well, like 100 kilograms down on my back squat, I'm 20 kilograms lighter, I tore my hamstring, so I'm rehabilitating it. So I don't know how the powerlifting is going to go, but I'm, I'm giving it my go. See, now, when I hear that you just, for laughs, basically, you broke some records for powerlifting, I would say, I would figure, why didn't she just stay doing that then if, if you realize that you're so naturally gifted at that? But, I mean, just looking through, and I've you know watched a lot of your YouTube videos, just a naturally, naturally genetically gifted person. But whenever someone first gets started working out, I always love to ask about, you know, genetics because everyone's not built the same. If I were to train just like someone else and do their supplements, do everything exactly like them, I'm not going to look just like them. But everyone always has that one body part that really, really takes off when they first get started training. And then they have that one body part that just drags behind it. They have to train to oblivion. What was the one body part that really took off for you? And what's the one body part that you've just had to drag behind this entire time? So 100% abs is the, the body part that, I don't need to touch, I don't need to look at, I don't need to kind of do anything and I have abs. Like, it's one of those, it was actually the reason I had to move out of bikini into women's physique because they were always like, you're only supposed to have the two outside lines. And I'm like, well, I can be 15% body fat and I'll still have blocks. So they, <laughs> my abs actually penalized me and pushed me out of bikini, which was fine because I actually think I prefer women's physique anyway. Um, and then my weakest body part is definitely my glutes. Um, I, I, I am very, very quad dominant. If I squat, I use my quads. If I leg press, I use my quads. If I run, I use my quads. If I 
do anything. It's close. So in order to grow a booty has been a absolute mission and it's still an absolute mission. And it's like one of my side hustles this year is like, you know what? I actually want a big booty, you know? <laughs> I mean, it's just so fascinating, especially when you talk to people that have competed, just how minuscule things affect different body parts and how, you know, you can just be so dominant in a few body parts, but you know, if you have a legging body part, that's just the one thing that surprised me the most about bodybuilding when I didn't have that much knowledge about it is just how minuscule things can get with proportions and all that stuff that ends up, you know, really affecting you. But what were your friends and family's reaction like when you first got started into this and how has it evolved over time? I think, I think when I first started with the bodybuilding, my parents expected it to be a phase. Um, and then that phase just kept on going and they were like, well, you know, cause they, they, my parents are very aloof at the best of times. So they, you know, they, they, they're kind of like, you do you, whatever you do. Uh, and they'll kind of like support you from a distance. Um, but they, they were very much kind of like, why are you doing this to yourself? Especially when, you know, I'm two weeks out from prep and I'm starving and I'm grunting and I don't want to talk to a single human being. And, you know, I'm craving everything in the world and even just speaking is exhausting. Um, so I think in many regards, they kind of looked at bodybuilding and they were like, why? Um, and they were surprisingly so happy when I got into a CrossFit. They were like, oh, it's so much healthier. And <laughs> Yeah, the, the nine hours of training is so much more healthier. <laughs> and it, that's the funny thing because, like, I actually – felt like in in many yes okay when you're like two weeks out from stage and you have zero percent body fat i mean when i was prepping for my the the show that i got my ifb blue pro card at a week out from comp um so no, let's let's backtrack so two weeks out from comp um i developed an infection so the doctor gave me anti-inflammatories and antibiotics I'm not eating anything. So the antibiotics and the anti-inflammatories ate through my stomach lining. And at midnight, um, I wake up and I start vomiting. And I then pass out in my own vomit. And then I projectile vomit some more. And then I pass out in my own vomit. And my boyfriend wasn't living with me at the time. So he comes over. And I'm like, no, 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 I'm fine. I'm fine. And he walks into the house and he's like, you're not vomiting food, you're vomiting blood. It looks like a massacre scene and there's blood everywhere because I had nothing in my stomach. So, you know, I was literally blood everywhere. So they rushed me to the hospital and the doctor's like, I think my blood pressure was like, it was like 45 over 10 or something. Absolutely ridiculous. And the doctor's like, how are you? coherent right now how are you even i mean that's why i kept on passing out um and then somehow i managed to kind of like still make it through the week and got my ifbb pro card so when it comes to you know like just just before stage i would say yes bodybuilding is unhealthy because your body fat is so low you know there's no you know i can't i can't deny it when you're you're that lean and you're that close to stage yes it is unhealthy however in terms of side effects in terms of how i felt in terms of everything crossfit was way worse um like i never believed in overtraining and when i was a bodybuilder i'm like oh what is overtraining this is bullshit you know like no such thing you can't overtrain you try crossfit and it's like yep it's real it's real, bro. <laughs> I have told so many guests who also have said, like, in your words, that they don't believe in overtraining. I've told them after we're done recording, try CrossFit and then tell me. I've said the same exact thing to them. And, you know, it's because, yeah, the moment that I've, because I've only had, you know, probably like a dozen or so CrossFit athletes on, and they all say the same thing about how much they train. I just think, like, how are you able to do that? First of all, recovery must be just a pain in the butt. Like, I don't even get how they're able to do that in the first place. I mean, like that, that was my downfall was I, I could not recover. I, I literally, towards the end, because I overtrained three times. The first time, uh, my, my body was like, nope, that's enough, and forced me to sleep for a week. I remember every single day I'd wake up and it'd be like two o'clock in the afternoon. And I'm like, 
where did the day go? You know, and that was me for an entire week. And then I gradually got back into it. Um, then this last time, my central nervous system was so fried, I couldn't sleep. So then it, I was insatiatingly hungry all the time because my body was trying to figure out how to recover. Um, and I was, I, I shit you not when I said, say I ate a kilogram of peanut butter every three days. And that was just a snack. So, so I was literally eating a kilogram of peanut butter every three days, um, and I couldn't recover, and I couldn't sleep, and I was crying every single day because I was so destroyed, and then I injured my wrist and my shoulder and my groin and re-injured my hamstring, and I was just like, no, it's not worth it. Like, like for what? I'm, I'm in the master's category now. Um, there's no recognition as a master's athlete, you know, why, why am I actually doing this to myself? And then someone attacked me and started bullying me because of course I've, I'm an IFBB pro, so there's certain connotations and I was like, you, you know, you're completely wrong. Um, and this is why I'm actually not recovering. So if you, um, but it was kind of like that, you know, why am I even doing this? Because everyone was still go well she's an IFBB pro she looks a certain way you know so I was just like nah it's not worth it okay this is a slight tangent but I've just noticed from here you're talking are you from Australia no I'm from South Africa oh okay that's what it was yeah because I was because like when you first started talking my since I've talked to so many people from all over the world like my accent has gotten a little bit better at detecting and then like five minutes in, I was like, wait, that doesn't really sound that, that, cause I, the guest I had from Nottingham, I was like, yeah, that doesn't really sound like someone from Nottingham. So then, okay. South Africa. That's so where in South Africa. Uh, Gauteng. Okay. Gauteng yeah. Can you still speak Afrikaans? Uh, I, 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 okay. My I'm, Afrikaans. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to pretend that I understood what she's, but yeah, she, so it's a little bit, I mean, yeah, I speak a tad bit German and that's, that's the only other, you know, language that I really have, but no, that's so where, did you grow up there or did you leave there when you were young? What's, what's that backstory? No, 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 no. So I actually just, we just moved to the UK two and a half years ago. So born and bred and raised in South Africa. So wait, you, what, so what's the gym scene like in South Africa? Cause I've never had someone from South Africa on and I'm just fascinated by, you know, especially when it's a country that I haven't talked to. So what is the fitness scene like over there? It's very small. It's, 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 it's so, you know, they're in their own little bubble where everyone thinks they're really cool. And you're kind of like, yeah, you're really cool until you go to another country and you realize, you know, you, you're not, uh, and you're a really small fish. Um, but I actually got my pro card in the UK because at the time there were no pro cards being available or handed out in South Africa because, of course, it's, it's so small. Um, since the NPC changeover, there are now IFBB pro, pro cards available in South Africa. But, yeah, it's, it's, it's very small in comparison. And what tends to happen, uh, which I found quite frustrating, and, and the, one of the reasons I actually completed more overseas, was they tend to almost like have a different marking criteria. Like when I was prepping and more not, I would look at the IFBB pros and I would go like, well, they look like that, so I'm going to aim for that. And then when I started aiming for that, they were like, no, 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 whoa, 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 we're not there, you know, we mark down, you know. So like you, if you almost had to like compete and get your qualifications to go overseas, because obviously you need to be invited to go overseas. Um, in say, so say you wanted to aim for figure, you would then compete in in fit. So let me switch it around. So say you wanted to be, do bikini, right? As a internationally, you would then enter figure in South Africa because their bikini is too soft. So you have to enter one division up, get the invite, and then obviously drop down to bikini internationally because that's where you're actually at. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? I've heard some similar stories from some other countries. Like one I had from the Philippines, it was somewhat similar to that. So yeah, I've it. it's not the first time I've heard it, but it's still, 
it still does boggle the mind when you honestly think about that. But I mean, let's be completely honest too. You're not the average looking woman. Even if you're all dressed up as you are right now, you've gotten to the point where like, it's, you can't really hide it. I mean, like, let's be completely honest. You re- Once you reach a certain size, it's hard to, I mean, you could be wearing the, the baggiest clothes ever, but like, what is that reaction that you get like in the general public? Cause I consider it to be like a mini celebrity, even just because it's human nature when they see something that's not of the normal to just be fascinated by it. And have you gotten used to it by now? Or is it still one of those things where you're like, okay, this is still kind of crazy. Some of the reactions that I get. I don't think I actually notice it. I'm not very good at observing other people. So someone may say, oh, you've got a lot of stairs, and I don't notice it. I'm very bad. Like, I'm I'm in my own little bubble. Like, I tend to zone out at gym and just focus on me, and I don't notice other people, um, which is really bad because sometimes I zone out staring at someone, and then they'll wave at me. And then I refocus and I'm like, oh shit, I was looking at you. I just got to interrupt you. I've done the same exact thing before. And then people think that I'm like stalking them. It's like, I am not thinking anything. Like I am just, I'm on autoplay sometimes. And I'm just like staring at something. And then a person might lo- like walk into the vision and stare at me for like five minutes and be like, is everything okay? Like, are you just like stalking or something? I'm like, oh, I wasn't even, yeah, that's happened yeah. to me a handful of times. Yeah. So, so that's me. Most of the time, I don't, I, I'm not very good with people in general, which is probably why I, I do well at bodybuilding and things kind of of that nature because I don't mind being alone. I don't like to go out and socialize and that sort of thing. Uh, so obviously staying to a diet and sticking to a program is far easier for me than someone who's like likes to be social and likes people, um, you know. So Guilty. it helps not, not liking people. <laughs> I was going to say that was one thing that struck me when I tried to you know compete as well is just the lack of social time where it's like, I don't even care if I have to take it like a salary or something like that. Like I just want to go out with friends. So that was a, another thing too. And that's another thing that I really praise the people that are able to do this sport because it's, there's just so much more dedication in it than a lot of people understand. But we now got to talk about pull-ups because Jesus Christ Lee, I, I told her when I was having her on, we have to discuss this because she was doing pull-ups with like, I think I did the equivalent and it was almost, uh, it was close to a hundred pounds because uh, being an American, everything's in pounds. And you are like one of probably like two women that I've ever seen able to do that. And you said your goal is to get your first pull-up. And like, if I were to see those clips and I'd be like, okay, she must've just been doing pull-ups her entire life. And then you're doing like the one arm stuff too. How long into your journey before you really develop that keen strength that's able to have you do all this stuff? So, I mean, like I never actually focused on it when I was doing bodybuilding obviously you know that wasn't a goal it's actually only now obviously I looked my first goal was a pull-up but that was kind of like just you know as a goal because everyone wants to do a pull-up so it became a goal of mine whereas this year or should I say after the crossfit I was like I actually need something to focus on and there are a lot of calisthenics people in the the gym that I train at. So I was kind of like, well, maybe, maybe with my powerlifting, I can do the calisthenics powerlifting because so there's, uh, I I don't know much about it. I'm still learning, but in the calisthenics, there's like a strength one and then there's the freestyle and then there's static holds. So those are the three different divisions. And the strength one is like your maximum, weighted pull up your maximum weighted muscle up your maximum dip and your muscle maximum squat so i've added those four elements into my powerlifting program so along with um deadlifting and bench i'm also doing pull ups muscle ups and dips yeah to see how heavy i can go how or at what point did you start to do the one arm things? Because you're one of the few people that actually does it the right way. I know most people do it where they like grip the, they grip the wrist and it's kind of like doing a two arm pull up. Like if we're being completely honest, I used to do that trick when I was in high school to try to impress people where I would be like, Hey, look, it's a one arm thing when technically it's not because you're just gripping here and you're like, you're still like almost using both hands. But how long until you did your first pull up, your first one arm pull up? Because when I first saw that, I was like, okay, you're one of the few people that actually does it like that. And it's incredibly impressive. Uh, thank you. I'm still getting there. I'm still getting there. I can do it with my arm and my shoulder, but I can't do it without that arm and the shoulder. Um, so I started calisthenics uh, end of November, um, and then kind of like halfway through December, I decided I'd try working towards the one on pull-up. So let's say two months now. 
I've been working towards the one on pull up. It's actually so difficult. I really hate her, everyone, because she's telling me that she breaks powerlifting records just for laughs, and now she's doing one arm pull ups after only two months of, of prepping for it. God. Can we just swap swap jeans just for one day, Lee? Come on. I mean, you probably won't like mine for the one day, but like, let's just come on. It's just ugh. I talked to some of well, these I guests. Mean, I'm, <laughs> like, I'm I'm just a very handsy person, so like, just don't make me do maths or anything like that because I'm not very good at that. Oh well, I mean, pff, once we My got maths sucks. once we got into like algebra, that's when I really struggled myself. You get you give me the multiplication division, you know I'm as smart as they come with that. But once that happens, you know, all bets are off the table, but with this lifestyle as well, I mean, there's so many miscon and misconceptions that people deal with. What are some of the ones that you deal with a lot and how do you like to dispel them? Because unfortunately so many people just aren't so familiar with the lifestyle that they tend to believe these myths without even doing their research. And I will admit myself, I thought some of the myths were true as well until I finally started talking to the people and expanding my horizons. Yeah. I mean, I suppose it- Obviously, a lot of people will think transgender or, you know, I must be a dyke or, you know, like I'm I'm only into women and like, you know, um, I'm a carpet muncher, that sort of thing. And I'm not. Um, I am very much like I, I like makeup. I like being feminine. I like everything girly, you know. I just happen to like muscles too. So I think that's probably one of the biggest misconceptions is the fact that people think, oh, I want to look like a man. I want to be a man and I want to be in a relationship with a girl. And it's like, no, no, no. I I like men. Thank you very much. You know? Well, and I always respond like, what kind of men are you hanging out with then if you think that that's what really like a man looks like? I mean, it's just, it's just so fascinating to me just how people, you know, come up with that sort of stuff. But what would, you say is probably the one thing that you wish you had known about this lifestyle before getting into it. Cause you mentioned before, like you didn't have that much knowledge. If you could go back and talk to yourself before you got into it, what would be the best piece of advice you'd give yourself? Eat more red meat. <laughs> like I actually was vegetarian for about two to three years of my training when I first started, because of course, you know, meat is bad for you. Um, so I used to love a medium rare steak. It was my absolute favorite. I love medium rare steak. And because I was vegetarian for so long, I actually can't do rare meat anymore. The texture just freaks me out. And I I literally can't eat it as a result. And I'm kind of like, I used to love rare steak. And now I've literally got to like kill the poor piece of meat in order to be able to eat it, uh, which is kind of sacrilege, you know. So I don't have a lot of steak because I just feel like I've just, you know, butchered the steak by cooking it through completely. But that's probably one of the things that I would go back and say, don't do it. Don't be an imbecile. Um, Red meat is good for you. Uh, Yeah, so that's probably one of the biggest things I'd say. And also going back and just, I bet there are times you go back and you look at your photos of you before you got into this. What goes through your mind when you see that? Because you've made such a drastic change and, you know, I've never, I mean, I've always been almost the same body shape my entire life. So I've never had that drastic of a physical change um, until, you know, I really started working out a little bit and then I, you know, had a little bit of change. But what's, what's that like for you when you go back and just realize how much progress and how much change you've made in your life? I don't know. I guess, like, you know, when I first started, I still had all those the misconceptions of bodybuilding and whatnot. So, you know, I looked at the girls and I'm like, oh, I never want to get that big. You know, I just want, you know, to be toned because, you know, toned is a real thing. Um, And then, of course, you get into it and you're actually like, you know what, actually, I like muscles. I want to get bigger. Um, So when I look back, I just see a different part of my life and a different part of my journey. And it's not like, I'm ashamed of that body or anything like that. I just, I look at, I look at the girl that I used to be and I call her a girl because even though I was 26 when I actually first started training, she was, she was still very protected, very shy. You know, I was in an abusive relationship, which I actually just released a YouTube video on explaining my situation. And I feel like, 
she in many ways, if I could go back in time and say, tell her, like, I'm, you'll be okay, you know, you will, you, you won't just get physically stronger, you'll get mentally stronger. I think that's what I see when I look back at the pictures is more kind of like the pain that I, I, I've been through and the progress that I've made mentally and physically and how proud I am to have overcome what I overcome, you know, in many regards. That makes sense. Absolutely. Well, I mean, speaking of pain, I got to ask, how painful was that tattoo on your neck? Because I, you know, just hearing stories of how painful tattoos are for people that even get them on like their leg or their arm. I can't imagine one on your neck. So what's, if you don't mind sharing, what's the story behind the tattoo and what was that like getting a tattoo on your neck? <laughs> so, so I'm not, I'm not one of those tattoo people that uh, has meaning behind the tattoo. I'm one of those, Oh, it looks pretty. I'm going to get it done. Um, <laughs> so to be honest, this wasn't as back, bad as my back tattoo. So my back tattoo, I finished a couple weeks out from comp when I was like shredded. So I had no body fat and I wanted to get it done. So I did two days in a row back to back. And I remember the tattoo artist saying, you actually need to calm down because you're bleeding too much and I can't get the ink into your skin. Um, so that was definitely the worst tattoo. Like, so I think you can see it actually. Oh, yeah, that's a big one. Yeah, so that was my back tattoo. And the funny thing is, I then went and got most of it tattoo removed and removed with laser. Uh, and removal is way worse. Removal is, is agonizing. Uh, so I actually never finished getting the tattoo removed. Uh, and I've decided I'm just going to do a blackout at some point because... The, 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 the removal process is agonizing on another level. Like, yeah. Let, let us know, little kids, don't get a tattoo unless you really, 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 really want it because removing it is not fun. Yeah. And make sure that you get a tattoo that doesn't make you look like an idiot when you're 70 years old, too, is always the advice that I always like to give people. Like, don't get something that you think is cool in the, when you're 20. Like, I know a guy that got one of, like, uh, when uh, – sports team was really successful. He got a tattoo of them and then he's like not even a fan of them anymore. So now it's like, you're going to have to live with that then for the rest of your life. I, I always just said, I've never gotten a tattoo myself, but I've, you know, I, I have friends that have gotten them as well. And you know, Hey, more power to you. I, I'm all for that. But just in this lifestyle in general, let's be honest, the moment that you get started, you sign a deal with the devil, which says, you know, you're never going to be big enough. You're never going to be good enough. Body dysmorphia is a huge thing. Yep. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's massive. And I, again, when I got into this, I thought that like, oh, hey, you know, it would solve a lot of things if I just got bigger and stronger. And then if I could go back and tell myself, I would just shake them down and say, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my entire life. But I've talked to some of the most in shape people on the planet and they still even more so have like severe cases of body dysmorphia. And how do you deal with that? Because it's something that I don't think a lot of people in the, you know, fitness industry like to talk about because they do have great bodies and they are in more shape than the average person. So they don't want to come out and say like, Oh, Hey, I have probably more insecurities than a lot of the normal people that don't train as much, but how do you deal with the bias morphia? I mean, like I, I won't deny when I was competing, it was, I was high, high critical. So when I was competing, nothing was good enough. Nothing was big enough. Nothing was good shredded enough. You know, they were always, all you see are the imperfections. And I think if you are competing in bodybuilding, that is something that you actually need. You need to hunt out perfection and continuously work towards it. Um, and obviously, psychologically, that is, that's not a good thing because then you're never actually happy with your progress. You can never appreciate how, you know, the sacrifice, the hard work, et cetera, et cetera, because all you're thinking about is that shoulder isn't big enough. Or, you know, my left bicep and my right bicep aren't quite symmetrical. So you're, you're hyper, hyper, hyper critical. Like I have a very thick waist uh, and I don't have a bodacious hourglass figure, you know. And it's one of those, like, I can't physically change that about myself. Uh, and then you see, you know, the winner of, of women's physique at the time uh, when I got my pro card. I can't remember her name. 
Trini K. Grant uh, with a 24-inch waist. And you're kind of like, well, I mean, if they're going that way, where it's literally the copy-paste of a figure girl except for bigger, then why am I even bothering? Um, and, and that was actually another reason why I actually stepped away from bodybuilding is because I looked at Shanique K. Grant, and don't get me wrong, I think she's got an absolutely phenomenal figure. But if I looked at her next to a figure girl, they were identical. She just had a bit more muscle mass, but in terms of her frame, her proportions, everything. And I always felt like, you know, before with Nicole K, with uh, Nicole and, you know, Daniel and Bailey and those girls, I felt like women's physique was the division where you didn't have to have the smallest weights. You know, you could be chunkier and you could just rely on an hourglass figure created through muscle whilst not necessarily having the smallest waist. And I was kind of like, when Shanique won, again, nothing against her, I was like, well, I can't get my waist 24 inches, and no matter how big my lats are and my glutes are, my waist will never get thinner than 28 inches, and I'm not willing to remove some ribs in order to get it smaller. You know, it's one of those things. No, it's, yeah. And when just how the sport changes over time too, is just something that's, you know, I've really just been amazed by even in the five and a half years that I've done this podcast, just how it's become, you know, night and day from what it was, you know, originally. But I mean, in powerlifting, you know, you can eat a little bit more. It's a little bit different. How does your body respond to being able to eat more? Because I know some people, their body just goes to that extreme then where they put on so much more because it kind of feels like they've been, you know, restricting themselves for so long. But how has your body responded to that? You know, I'm not going to say lax nutrition, but it's it's a different type of nutrition than when you were competing or doing CrossFit. Because when you're in CrossFit, I mean, you're burning so many calories that you can just, you know, have your mouth wide open and just stuff stuff down it. But what's that difference been like? So I'm I'm not actually one of those people who eats off diet so regardless of where what i'm doing my diet remains extremely strict um so even though the proportions and the macros might change the base of my diet remains the same and regardless of what i've done my diet has changed has stayed pretty consistent for the past like 10 years so what I ate 10 years ago and what I eat tomorrow morning is literally the same. Um, I am, I'm pretty much that boring. Um, the only thing that may change is kind of like the consistency. So like right now I'm doing baked oats and then I went through a phase where I did make them into pancakes. And before that I made them into porridge. So literally the ingredients will stay the same. It's just what I make them into that varies. Um, so obviously with the CrossFit, I was eating a lot more, but it was the same stuff minus the peanut butter, which was just to bump my calories up. Um, then when I stopped the CrossFit, I just, I just didn't like being so chunky. Like I weighed about 75 kilograms and I was like, you know, now that I'm not too sure what I want to do, I actually just wanted to lose some weight. So I've dropped down, I've dropped like 12 kilograms. I'm currently sitting at 63 kilograms, 63, 64, um, which isn't actually ideal for the powerlifting because I am quite lean for powerlifting. But I just, you know, I think it's that that comparable balance between liking what I see in the, in the mirror and still being able to train effectively. Um, and it's, it's also one of those, I'm not planning on competing anytime soon, so I'm okay being slightly leaner. Uh, and obviously, again, coming from the bodybuilding, I've seen my body shredded. So it's, it's, it's always that mental hurdle of like, yeah, but I know what my body can look like at 8% body fat. So why do I want to be rolling around at 14% body fat and feeling slightly kind of like pudgy, even though you're not pudgy, you know, you're not pudgy at all, but you're used to a certain condition. So I've actually kind of found that middle balance where I can perform, probably not be as strong as I could potentially be, 
but I like what I see in the mirror. That makes sense. Oh, absolutely. I mean, like, yeah, she consistently looks like she's like six to eight weeks out of a show. And that's, you know, I know some people that are just like that where they just in- enjoy that look. But what is your favorite powerlifting lift and what is your least favorite one to do? Um, so because of torn hamstring, I squats went from being my favorite to my least favorite. Um, and I love bench. Bench is, is my favorite by far. So I can bench more than I can squat, which is absolutely atrocious. I was going to say you might be the first power lift I've ever heard say that, but you know, Hey, it goes, you know, with the injuries too. I, I under, I understand that, but yeah, it's, I mean, I was the gym bro myself too, where it was bench and you know, that was what we measured ourselves by at least when I was, at least when I was younger. But what has that been like too, just to see the fitness industry industry change and evolve so much in the decade that you've been doing it. Cause like I said, how much it's changed in the five and a half years that I've been doing this, but for 10 years, I mean, it's even more so. And what's that just been like as someone who's also been in it and someone who's also, you know, not competed maybe for a while, but you've, you know, just been in the fitness industry. What's that been like to see all this change? I mean, I guess for me, I've been kind of self removed because I've, I've gone from, from bodybuilding back to, to CrossFit. And now I'm kind of like in the powerlifting. So I guess I've never been like all consumed. And I tend to not get into the industry even as a whole. Like if you tell me what's going on, I'll be like, oh, I did not know that. And I did that more from a mental standpoint because um, I, I became it almost like self-destructive, if you know what I mean, where you start to compare yourself continuously to everyone else. You're scrolling through Instagram and you're just like, that person looks like that, that person looks like that. Oh my word, that, you know, and it, it just, you know, you're then comparing yourself to someone who's probably taken their photos in the best lighting under the best circumstances and best conditions. And they look, they may have one good feature that you're focusing in on, whereas you may have other good features, but you know, they've got a small waist or they've got giant shoulders. So I actually intentionally removed myself from the industries in a lot of regards. Um, like my Instagram is cats and dogs. Um, and my Facebook is cats and dogs. So I can't actually validly answer that question because I don't intentionally follow the industry on purpose, which is probably not what you want to hear. Oh, not at all. I mean, I totally understand. I trust me. There've been times where I've wanted to just completely, you know, plug off as well, but before we wrap things up, I do got to ask you because your Instagram account was hacked and you know, you were at like a hundred thousand. How did you deal with that? And for, well, first of all, how that happened for anyone. So that doesn't happen to anyone else again. And what was that like dealing with that? Cause like, I'm only at like 9,000. If I was at a hundred thousand, it got hacked. Like I would lose my mind. So how did you deal with that? Um, I mean, I cried <laughs> because it's my main source of income. So I, I cried. Uh, and then I tried to get it back and I couldn't. Uh, then I, I, I uh, paid a hacker to try to get it back and uh, lost a lot of money uh, because, as you can tell, I, I don't have my account back. So I paid a lot of money for nothing. Um, and then I was like, OK, so take two. Let me try again. Uh, so if you I don't know if you followed my own my old account compared to my new account you'll see that i'm posting very very different stuff to what i used to post um and that is as a result of my account being deleted so i'm just like okay well and also another thing was and i I came to this realization was um before i would post more kind of like sexy kind of stuff and that was because i wasn't ashamed of being shredded but you get a lot of hate you know if you're a muscular girl but you're still wearing lingerie and you're posing all pretty yeah you might get the odd kind of hate comment but it's not really you know all that terrible but I love lifting heavy and I love being shredded and I was always like ashamed to kind of post my workout videos and that kind of content because it you are way more likely to get hate and negativity and oh she looks like a man uh whereas now i'm kind of like you know what actually fuck it like 
this is me. I like looking like this and I like lifting heavy stuff. And if I'm going to get hate for it, I'm going to get hate for it. So I might as well just be me. Did you find out how it happened? Was it like one of those messages that they sent where you clicked on something or? No, I literally got no notification whatsoever. I woke up and my account was deleted. Um, Nothing, no email, no notification, nothing. And funnily enough, Seth Ferrosi's account got deleted the same day as mine. And two other female bodybuilders I know's accounts also got deleted the same day as mine. So they clearly decided female bodybuilders are the enemy and we're going to delete everyone's accounts. Even though Seth Rossi is a male bodybuilder, but he got deleted on the same day as me. I was going to say, everyone, that's why I change my password every single month. And, you know, I have it just only written in a place where I can find it myself just in case. But, yeah, it's it's crazy. that, And it's it's happened more frequently than people would imagine for like I've had probably about a dozen guests on that. Yeah, that's the same thing has happened to them where they just don't even know. And they, it's not even something that they clicked on or anything. But, yeah, really, you know, watch out for that people. And I'd love to have you back on in a year just to discuss what you've been up to. Where What are your goals for this year? Where would you like to be at this time next year? Um. I have no idea. Um, <laughs> I'm focusing on business right now, literally. So that's why I'm not too concerned about competing. Um, I'm literally just like, I want to focus on business because that got so severely neglected with the CrossFit. Like I literally couldn't think when I was doing the CrossFit. So it's 100% get my business back up and running and, and pump that for the time being. Absolutely. Well, everyone, I recommend that you check out her Instagram page. I'll leave a link down below as well as her YouTube as well. She has such good content on her YouTube. I mean, she should Yay, definitely, oh yeah, you should definitely have more subscribers too. So anyone, you know, I'll leave a link to that as well. And yeah, it's a lot of good content as well. I did. I do love the fact that you do use, I, I've always wanted to use captioning myself, but I've always thought that, you know, maybe things might get, you know, a little messy with that. I was so not on my D on the spot page, but on my personal page, I commented on one of yours because there was a typo on one of your things where you were saying something. And then it said like something about like Palestinians or skinny or something like that. Like it was, it was something where like you said something about like push or something like that, but then the translation oh, yes. in, in the, in the Google thing. So yeah, I, that's one of the reasons why I haven't tried it myself because dear God, some of the stuff that's said on this podcast, if stuff gets translated wrong, you never know what's going to, you never know what people are going to think, but no, again, everyone check out her stuff. I really recommend it. And Lee, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your journey with us. I really appreciate it. Okay. Thank you so much for having me on. Absolutely. Well, everyone, this is Ryan Johnson, DD on the spot, signing off. Have a great day, everyone.